The superstitions practiced by the Roman Church kept men's consciences bound to her false doctrines. People were taught to trust in their own good works to save themselves. God and even Christ were depicted as stern and sullen. Only through the priests and the saints could they come to Christ. This altar at the Chiesa del Gesù in Rome depicts Mary booting two reformers out of heaven. They are Martin Luther and John Huss. Below the altar, a little angel is tearing pages out of a book, the Holy Word of God, the Bible. Although this was sculpted in the early 1700s, it represents the defiant attitude of the Catholic Church during the 1260 years of spiritual darkness. The Waldenses understood the teachings of Rome and the bondage in which the people lived. These faithful missionaries longed to point these people to the loving Jesus who died that they might obtain true liberty. Searching out the honest in heart, they taught them that Jesus was their true priest, that to Jesus alone they must confess their sins and that Jesus was faithful to forgive them and to cleanse them from sin. Thus, the light of truth came into many a darkened mind. The Son of Righteousness shone into their hearts with healing in His beams. Now the fear of death was banished, and they were able to look up and accept Christ fully. Although these new converts faced persecution, they were filled with joy and courage. And they, like all true followers of Christ, told others of their newfound faith, and many joined the Waldensian believers. In the year 1488, Pope Innocent VIII decreed that all the Waldensian people of the Cochin Alps were to be put to death. A papal sword was to be unsheathed to be used against God's commandment-keeping people and was not to be returned to its scabbard while a single confessor of the faith remained alive. Rome insisted that the Waldenses should submit to her power. Church officials were sent out with a decree in hand and informed them thus that if they would come to the bosom of the Church of Rome and embrace the Roman Catholic religion, they should enjoy their houses, properties, and lands, and live with their families without the least molestation. But if they refused to comply with these propositions, persecution should ensue and certain death be their portion. To each of the propositions declared, the Waldenses nobly replied that no considerations whatever should make them renounce their religion. Because of their refusal to submit to Rome, the papacy chose Albert Catania to lead in a daring attack against the Waldenses. The plan of attack was designed to strike a deadly blow in the center of the Waldensian territory, the Valley of Angronia. Catania's army was to be separated into two divisions. One division, led by Catania himself, moved toward the Pra del Tor via the valley of Angronia, destroying everything on their way. The cruel La Palu led the other division up the Alps of Daphne and entered the Vale of Louise, a deep gorge overhung by towering mountains. Waldensian scouts observed the papal forces invading their territory. Hastily placing their goods in carts and gathering their flocks and herds, the Waldenses began to climb the rugged slopes of Mount Pelvo, rising 6,000 feet above the valley. Songs of praise to God rose from their lips, dispelling their terror. About halfway up, at the top of an immense precipice, they came upon a platform of rock, leading into a large cavern. 
The roof of the cave formed a magnificent arch, which gradually narrowed into a small passageway, then widened into a roomy hall. The herds were distributed along the side cavities of the cave. Mothers, fathers, and children found room inside, and the entrance was barricaded with huge stones. Then able-bodied men posted themselves to watch. The enemy, knowing their prey was in the cave, approached from above. Soldiers were let down by ropes from the precipice overhanging the entrance to the grotto. The platform in front of the cave was secured by La Palou's men. The Waldenses retreated deeper into their hiding place. Rather than sending his troops into the cave, La Palou ordered his men to collect all the wood they could find, and piling it up at the entrance of the cave, set it on fire. A huge volume of black smoke rolled into the cave. One can only imagine the feelings of God's people in that cave when the smoke filled the cavern, suffocating all its inhabitants. Surely they hung on to the promises of God. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. When the cavern was afterward examined, there were found in it 400 infants suffocated in their cradles or in the arms of their dead mothers. Altogether, there perished in this cave more than 3,000 Waldenses. What was the crime that deserved this frightful punishment? It was dependence upon the Bible as the only rule of faith and rejection of the traditions and teachings of the Roman Catholic Church. While La Palou was on his mission of destruction on Mount Pelvo, Catania was leading his army north and west to destroy the Waldenses in the valley of Angronia. Into the narrow defiles he led his soldiers, beyond where great rocks overhung the path. But there was no resistance. On into the valley of Angronia, Catania and his host marched. The homes of the Waldenses were empty, and the valley was empty as well. Catania surmised that the people of the valley had fled to the Pra del Tor. Between Catania and his prey rose a steep, unscalable mountain, which runs like a wall across the valley. It seemed that the advance of the papal legate and his army would end before this great natural barricade. They could see the white peaks of the high mountains surrounding the Pra. After much searching, Catania discovered the single path that opens through the mountain. Some convulsion of nature had rent the mountains, forming a long, narrow, dark chasm. Catania boldly ordered his men to enter and traverse this frightful gorge not knowing how few of them he would ever lead back. The only pathway through this chasm is a rocky ledge on the side of the mountain, so narrow that no more than two abreast could advance along it. If assailed from in front, behind, or above, there is absolutely no retreat. Nor is there room for those attacked to fight. The pathway is hung midway above the bottom of the gorge, where torrents of water rage over the rocks. It was into this terrible defile that the soldiers of the Papal Legate now marched. They advanced as best they could along the narrow ledge. They were now nearing the Praw. It seemed impossible for their prey to escape them, but God was watching over his people. As the enemy soldiers advanced along the narrow path, a white cloud no bigger than a man's hand, unobserved by the invaders, but keenly watched by the Waldenses, was seen to gather on the mountain summit. The cloud grew rapidly bigger and darker. It came rolling down the mountainside, wave after wave, 
like an ocean tumbling out of heaven, a sea of murky vapor. It fell right into the chasm in which the papal army was situated, sealing it up and filling it from top to bottom with a thick fog. In a moment, the host were in night. They were bewildered, stupefied, and could see neither before or behind, could neither advance nor retreat. They halted in a state of terror. The Waldenses interpreted this as an interposition of providence in their behalf. The power to repel the invader had been given them. They tore out huge stones and rocks and sent them thundering down into the ravine. The papal soldiers were crushed where they stood. Nor was this all. Some of the Waldenses boldly entered the chasm, sword in hand, and attacked them in front. Consternation seized the Piedmontese host. Panic impelled them to flee. But their effort to escape was more fatal than the sword of the Vaudois, or the rocks that swift as arrows came bounding down the mountain. They jostled one another. They threw each other down in the struggle. Some were trodden to death. Others rolled over the precipice and were crushed on the rocks below or drowned in the torrent. So perished miserably the enemies of God. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. It was said that there were three missionaries that traversed the south of Europe during the Middle Ages. The troubadour, the barb, and the mightiest of all, the Bible. The troubadours must have been a colorful sight as they approached a medieval castle. Foremost in their minds was the burden to present God's truth as it is written in his holy word. As a troubadour entered through the castle gate with his lute, the people anxiously gathered to hear any news of the outside world and to hear the minstrel play and sing for their entertainment. The common minstrels sang the provincial love songs of the period, but the Waldensian missionaries sang portions of songs which taught virtue and hatred of vice. As the people listened, some were moved to hear more from the singing evangelist. In this way, the Waldensian minstrels taught the people that God was the only object of worship, the Bible the only rule of faith, and Christ the only means of salvation. From castle to castle, these dedicated servants of Christ witnessed by singing their songs and teaching the precious truths found in God's word. The Waldenses were among the first of the people of Europe to obtain a translation of the Holy Scriptures. Hundreds of years before the Reformation, they possessed manuscripts of the Bible in their native tongue. They had maintained the apostolic faith, pure and unadulterated. This rendered them the special objects of hatred and persecution. They declared the Church of Rome to be the apostate Babylon of the apocalypse, and at the peril of their lives they stood up to resist her corruptions. As a result of long-continued persecution, some compromised their faith. 
little by little yielding its distinctive principles, yet others held fast the truth. Through ages of darkness and apostasy, there were always Waldenses who denied the supremacy of Rome, who rejected image worship as idolatry, and who kept the true Bible Sabbath. Under the fiercest tempests of opposition, they maintained their faith. Though gashed by the Savoyard spear and scorched by the Romish faggot, the Waldenses stood unflinchingly for God's word and his honor. They were accused by their enemies of every crime and base practice. They were called sorcerers and charged with worshiping Lucifer in the form of a black cat. The children of these Vaudois were always born, it was said, with hairy throats, with four rows of black teeth, and with a single eye in the middle of their forehead. On one occasion, the Duke of Savoy visited his Waldensian subjects after a time of persecution and asked to see those monstrous children, but was convinced of the deceptive calumny when beautiful, rosy-cheeked children with pearly teeth and two eyes were brought before him. Long before the German Reformation, the Waldenses were an evangelistic people, loving the Bible above all things, making translation of it into the common tongue, spreading it abroad in Bohemia, in Germany, in France, and in Italy. The missionary zeal of the Waldenses and their great success in spreading Bible truths resulted in the terrible persecutions which they endured. Yet, the blood of these martyrs watered the seeds of the gospel. From earliest childhood, the Waldensian youth were instructed in the scriptures and taught to sacredly regard the claims of the law of God. The children memorized whole chapters of the Bible so that whatever might befall the written copies of the Bible, large portions of it might be secure in the memories of their young men and maidens. In the darkness of night, at secret gatherings in their homes, they went barefoot or with shoes bound in rags that they might not be heard in passing. It was their custom to listen to the Gospels recited in turn by the young, each one repeating a certain portion. And to the women were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she was nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. And the dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Every barb or pastor learned a manual trade or profession. All knew how to cultivate the fields and care for the flocks and herds. Before the invention of printing, they copied large portions of the scriptures for use by their scholars, to whom they also taught the languages and instructed them in piety and good works. Each was required to memorize the books of Matthew and John. But many of them memorized the entire New Testament and much of the Old. They placed it in their minds and in their hearts to share with those with whom they would come in contact as they went out on their missionary journeys for the Lord Jesus Christ. The 16th century dawned as the Waldenses were still recovering from the persecutions led out by generals La Palou and Catano. The Duke of Savoy had promised them security in their valleys, but it was not altogether in his power to make his promise good. He could take care that such armies of crusaders as that which mustered under the standard of Catano should not invade their valleys but he could not guard them from the secret conspiracies of the priesthood. In the absence of the Duke's armed soldiers, the inquisitors and priests of Rome, acting as missionaries, seduced the people with their sophistries and kidnapped others, carrying them off to the holy office. 
To these annoyances was added the yet greater evil of a decaying piety. A desire for repose made many conform outwardly to the Romish church. In order to be shielded from all interruption in their journeys on business, they obtained from the priests who were settled in the valleys certificates or testimonials of their being papists. To obtain this credential, it was necessary to attend the Romish chapel, to confess, to go to mass, and to have their children baptized by the priests. At the same time, they continued to attend the preaching of the Vaudois pastors and to submit themselves to their censures. Beyond all question, the men who practiced these deceits and the church that tolerated them had greatly declined. That old vine seemed to be dying. A little while, and it would disappear from off those mountains which it had so long covered with the shadow of its boughs. At this very time, the Protestant Reformation was breaking forth over Europe. The Waldenses, eager to know to what extent the yoke of Rome had been cast off by the nations of Europe, sent some of their pastors to Switzerland and Germany on a mission of inquiry. They desired to make known their beliefs and practices and see how they compared to what these new reformers believed. A synod was called forth and representatives from various parts of Europe came to meet with the Waldenses of Italy and France. The representatives assembled together on the 12th of October, 1532, at the town of Chanforan, in the heart of the valley of Engronia. At the conclusion of this assembly, the findings were embodied in a short confession of faith, in which the Waldenses and the reformers agreed upon. The moral inability of man, election to eternal life, the will of God as made known in the Bible, the only rule of duty, and the doctrine of two sacraments only, baptism and the Lord's Supper. In their eagerness and joy to join with others who opposed the errors of Rome and cherished the word of God, the Waldenses gave up the last vestiges of the Bible Sabbath for the Sunday worship of the reformers. The remnant Sabbath keepers still among them were silenced, and the majority of the Waldenses joined the reformers to become part of a greater movement to protest against papal oppression. The lamp, which had been on the point of expiring, began to burn with its former brightness. The spirit of the Waldenses revived they no longer practiced those dissimulations and cowardly concealments to which they had had recourse to avoid persecution. They no longer feared to confess their faith. From here on, they were never seen at Mass or in the Popish churches. They refused to recognize the priests of Rome as ministers of Christ, and under no circumstances would they receive any spiritual benefit or service at their hands. Into the hands of the reformers, the Waldenses placed a most appropriate and noble gift. That book, the Bible, which their fathers had preserved with their blood, which their barbs had laboriously transcribed and circulated. They now translated into the French language and printed at their own expense for the churches of the Reformation. Strengthened by the fellowship of their Protestant brethren, the Waldenses rebuilt their churches and reinstituted worship services. Pastors were multiplied and crowds flocked to their preaching to drink of these living waters again flowing freely in their land. 